Hey guys, and welcome to the show. Uh, today we're going to talk about privileged access workstation scenarios. And uh, just ignore the shark. Hey guys, and welcome to the show. Today we have John Rodriguez with us. John, say hi. Hi there, everybody. <laughs> Wow, he's got more enthusiasm than I do today. That's pretty <laughs> rare. <laughs> so, hey, John, man, tell us what your title is. I am a cybersecurity architect on what used to be the U.S. national practice in MCS, uh, Microsoft Consulting Services, and now we are the worldwide practice at the stroke of a pen. We didn't actually get any head count. We just now cover the entire world. Oh, yeah. Don't you love it when that happens? <laughs> yeah, a couple of my teammates are over in Dubai right now. Yeah, um, I'm just going to call you Sherman Williams because you're covering the entire planet. It's funny, I've actually done work for Sherwin Williams. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so we're going to talk about pause today. Can you give us a little background? What is pause? Sure. A PAW is a privileged access workstation, and it's a mechanism that we use to try to help avoid the exposure of privileged credentials to attackers or uh, unwanted parties within your network. It's kind of a a standard piece of our credential theft mitigation suite and it builds very much on some of the work that uh, viewers, long-term viewers of Taste of Premier will have seen in the past, some of the things that Jessica Payne and Mark Simos have talked about in previous editions. Yeah, awesome. So uh, that sounds great. I, I understand you have a presentation for us just to kind of get everybody acclimated. I sure do. It's it's a short presentation. I'm not going to bore anybody to death with PowerPoint today, but it just helps set the tone and helps explain some of the basic uh, ideas behind it. It also gives a very important website where we publish this guidance publicly, which is really the reason I'm here today. It's to get people aware of this public presentation, this public guidance that they themselves can use without any further help from Microsoft or any other third party. They can use this to build PAW these workstations in their own environment and then use that to further secure their privileged access. So yeah, let's switch to the PowerPoint. Hey, before you get started, tell us about your relationship with Mark and Jessica. So it's kind of funny because Mark Simos is a, an architect. He was actually the person who recruited me into the architect role a couple of years ago. And so Mark is one of my mentors. And I started working with Jessica in her second or third week at Microsoft. We went to an incident response together uh, here in in uh, the, the central region. And so I became her mentor. So Mark is my mentor. I'm Jessica's mentor. So you've got this like grand mentor chain, but, but it doesn't end there, does it, Lex? No, it doesn't. And that's actually kind of funny because I was an FST trainer here in Charlotte for a long time when, when Mark came in. So uh, I guess technically I helped train Mark. So it's this grand mentor chain from Lex to Mark to me to Jessica. Although, uh, in fairness, I should say, for all of Jessica's loyal viewers out there, I learn just as much from her as she does from me. And In fact, I probably learn more from her. Uh, brilliant lady and uh, a lot of fun to work with. So, Yeah, she's Jessica, awesome. Don't, she's, yeah, don't take us a slight, Jessica. Yeah, no, Jessica's awesome. She's, she's, she's just phenomenal. And so is Mark. So yes. you've, got, you've got kind of a high bar here, John. I do. I do. I'm going to try to. I'm going to try to sidle up to it so they they don't notice them trying to break their records for views. But in this presentation, it's it's a relatively short one. I just want to kind of set the stage here. This uh, this slide and one of the upcoming slides are from the Securing Privileged Access deck that Andrew and Mark are, are going to present in an upcoming program. The idea is that identity is a security perimeter because identities are used not just within the corporate network but outside the corporate network. You may have a, a cloud identity, whether it's your social media like Twitter or Facebook. You may have a Azure or Amazon Web Services subscription. That Your identity connects to all of these different things and it's used to manage all sorts of different resources, whether they're internal or external. So we say that identity is a new security perimeter. But more than that, oops, it's the security perimeter under attack. An administrator is often doing multiple things at once, and they're using often the same machine to do those things. So if I'm connecting to the web and I manage Active Directory, I'm actually putting my organization at risk. This is the standard credential theft spiel for those that have heard it before. If I visit the wrong website, an attacker has planted a, 
malware, malvertising, cross-site scripting, you name it. If there's something on one of those websites that is that can compromise my workstation, and then I use that same workstation to administer Active Directory, I potentially have lost control of my Active Directory to the adversary. And one small mistake can lead to attacker control. I don't want to make it seem like the only attack vector is browsing the internet. Of course, there's, there's spam. I click the wrong email and download something to my workstation, or I connect uh, the wrong USB. I find a USB in the parking lot. I want to see what's on it takes control of my workstation, and so on. Many, many different attack vectors, all of which ultimately have the same goal of trying to wrest control of the directory and the resources in the company away from the administrator. As defenders, we have a tendency to think of, our, of all of our assets and lists. We're protecting the perimeter. We're protecting X number of things. But attackers don't think that way. Attackers will take a small advantage and parlay that by looking for the connections between different objects. They compromise one thing, which leads to the compromise of the next, which leads to the compromise of the next. And ultimately, they get to the thing that they really find of value, whether it's control of Active Directory, a SQL database with credit card information, what have you. And this is summed up fantastically well in this quote from John Latour. I don't know that he came up with it. If he did, it's an awesome quote. If he didn't, the other people should get credit. Either way, it's defenders think in lists, attackers think in graphs, and as long as this is true, the attackers win. And there's a great blog entry from John uh, from last April, but it's still just as relevant today as it was uh, nearly a year ago. I find this to be really, really important, and we need to think about the true graph. It's not just the workstations, it's the identities that use those workstations. The identities may be the commonalities. And unfortunately, enterprises are not small. I, I stole this screenshot from the presentation that we just released on a Windows Defender Advanced Threat Protection, which comes out later this year. And this is just a common enterprise. Look at all of these connections. You can see that there are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of workstations, computer objects on the screen. And you can see the little green lines emanating from them. But if you notice, there are certain systems that kind of are the, the, the choke points, whether that's a jump server, a remote desktop system, or maybe it's a help desk PC that's used to connect to all these systems. Attackers look for and exploit those common points to almost acts as a bridgehead, almost to serve as that point that allows them to get anywhere else. Uh, think of them as hubs in train stations or airport hubs or choose your, <laughs> you know, choose your, your metaphor here. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned something uh, earlier, and I didn't want to say anything then because I didn't want to interrupt you because you, sure. you were doing so great. But, <laughs> but you said, you said uh, people picking up USB drives in the parking lot. That's a real scenario, isn't it? It's a very real scenario. I can, you can just go out on, on your web search engine of choice and find literally dozens of examples where penetration testers and security researchers have actually posted blog entries talking about how they were able to compromise Contoso or Woodgrove Bank by simply seeding the parking lot with USB drives. I remember reading one research paper that said of the 20 drives that he dropped in a particular organization's parking lot, which was the size of a football field, Apparently, 13 of them were activated within the hour. Wow. And that's just, it's, it's an awful statistic. That also goes to the idea we have to assume breach. We have to assume that the end users will do something that will potentially invite the attackers in. Now, assume breach does not mean we assume that the organization has been completely pwned. It means that we assume that there's going to be those, those tiny little incursions. And the idea is that we want to minimize the scope, the, the scale of the actual compromise. If, it, it's yeah. like welcoming the attacker into the United States, saying, hi, welcome to Guam. By the way, there are no flights to the mainland. Right, yeah. You know, I tried that trick with five and a quarter inch floppies, but nobody picked them up. Yeah, uh, probably three and a half inch floppies is going to be likewise a fail. Actually, the yeah. laptop that I'm using to talk to you now doesn't even have a CD-ROM. Yeah, no, either does mine. It's funny, we were talking, so, so this really has nothing to do with this topic, <laughs> right? But we were, we were uh, there's a video going around right now uh, on, on the internet about kids trying to use Windows 95, like millennials trying to use Windows 95. And, you know, <laughs> how do you connect to the internet? You know, what's, the, is this a, mo a modem? You know, what's a modem? You know, yep. yeah, and it's, it, it's just hilarious. Uh, how far we've come in such a short period of time. Well, it's, it, it's no different than trying to show somebody a, a rotary dial phone or right. an old Wi-Fi. 
it, it's just it's progress. I, I I find it funny that we find it funny that people from a later generation don't understand these things. It's just like we don't understand some of the things our grandparents went through. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, so back to the presentation. Back to the presentation. Now, because Mark and others have talked about lateral traversal and credential theft in previous editions, I'm not going to go through a demo or belabor the point. I just want to kind of highlight lateral traversal in a nutshell, basically. The idea is that a workstation contains a, a process, it's called LSAS, local security agent, and it essentially has the identities of the, the, sorry, it has representations of the identities that have logged into the system. It takes their password information, turns it into a hash, and then it can use that hash to connect to other systems. So there's a local administrator account, potentially, there's the antivirus service account, there's the person who's actually logged on, there's the computer account, all of these are stored in LSAS, but there are tools, WCE, Windows Credential Editor, Mimikatz, and others that can take those identities and reuse them in unexpected ways. So if I'm logged in as a system, or on the system as Alice, an attacker can hijack my session and use it to look at other sessions that are simultaneously logged on. Maybe the local somebody used the local administrator account a little while ago to do some uh, installation. Maybe they used run as or connected using remote desktop, or maybe there's a service, a service that's running under the specific context of a service account. So the attacker can take that and basically change his or her network identity. When he connects to another system, he pretends to be somebody else. He takes the information from LSAS and becomes temporarily the local administrator or the antivirus service account and uses that to connect to another system. This is kind of following the nodes on that graph that I showed earlier. And then the idea is that he or she is looking for those privileged identities. In this example, the attacker uses local administrator to go from the first workstation to the second workstation. Well, he can't go from the second workstation to the third one using the local administrator account because the password hashes are different. But there's that common antivirus service account that exists and, and works on both boxes. So the attacker switches contexts, takes that one, gets to the third system, and now has access to domain admin. Now, the attacker doesn't have access to the username and password, has access to basically a representation of that. And you can think of it kind of as one-time use. The attacker can go from this workstation to another system using that domain admin hash, but of course, because it's domain admin, the destination is going to be a domain controller. The attacker is able to do things like run invoke ninja copy to copy the, the database offline, can put persistence mechanisms in place by changing the properties of services and so on and so forth. So once the attacker gets his or her hands on domain admin, it's essentially game over. I'll see right. the film Aliens, I'm sure. Yeah. So in the past, Jessica's talked about some of the mitigations for this. We can put uh, rules in place, firewall rules in place to prevent Workstation 1 and Workstation 2 from being able to speak to one another. We can do things like segment the service accounts so that service accounts are not common to large groups of machines. But then it still leaves the problem of that third workstation. The third workstation is used by a general user and by an administrator. And if you combine those two activities, if you have internet access or line of business application access, and you're doing things on privileged systems, you're connected to domain controllers, then you run the risk that in your internet browsing, you pick something up. In this, the example on screen, we'll just say you visit the wrong website. You go out to you know, your, your daily news website and unbeknownst to you, an attacker has compromised it. There's a cross-site scripting attack and he redirects you to a, a nasty site where you pick up all sorts of malware. Even though your system is running antivirus, even though your system is running anti-malware, even though you have a firewall, because you went to the website, it's allowed. So you pick up this, this thing, it's malware, credential theft program, what have you, and then you connect to a domain controller to do your work afterwards. Because your privileged identity was, is now visible to the attacker, he can grab that and off to the races he goes. So we try to focus on, as part of securing privileged access, we try to focus on the things that are going to provide the most value. And again, referring back to uh, some of the things we did, others have talked about, we want a separate administrator account for those administrative tasks. So we wouldn't want Alice 
to have, or we would not want Alice's account to be in a member of the domain admins group. Alice should have an account where she does email and internet browsing, but she is not a domain admin. That's the first step. Right. The second step in our roadmap is the privileged access workstations that I'm talking about today. And you can see right there, we've got the link, aka.ms slash cyberpaw, P-A-W. This is our public guidance. We've made this guidance freely available to anyone. You don't have to be a premier customer to access the URL. It's just on the, the regular internet. And a privileged access workstation is essentially a second system that you use to do administrative work. You never log into that system with your regular end user credentials. You only ever log in with your domain admin credentials. We'll talk about what this looks like in a little bit more detail in a moment. I just want to finish up with the rest of the, the recommended immediate two to four week uh, recommendations. Unique local admin passwords for workstations using the LAPS tool that Jessica talked about in the previous edition. And if possible, extend that same protection to your member servers, whether they're uh, Exchange servers or SQL servers or whatever. They will all have that uh, a uh, local, a built-in local administrator account. We want them to have separate passwords so that an attacker can't simply compromise one workstation and use that local administrator account to move from system to system to system to system. Cool. So, yeah. Yep. You got a question there? No, I, that just makes good sense, right? We like to think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, unfortunately, we're, we're still trying to convince people that this is a necessary, uh, necessary and, and critical thing to do. That's one of the reasons we actually published the guidance. It's right. funny. We've had people say, are you crazy? Microsoft sells a PAW deliverable. We actually have an MCS offering where we will come in and help you build pause, deploy pause, identify who needs pause, and so on. And we're giving you the instructions to build these things? Well, yes, it's this important. We feel it's so important. We want as many people to have pause as possible. If your organization has the operational maturity, has the availability, time and resources, and the expertise to do this, we want you to do it on your own. If you can't, if you don't have the time, if you don't have the resources, etc., and you want us to do it, we can come in and get it done very quickly for you. But the idea is that we want everybody to be doing using a PAW model. We want every organization on the planet to segment their administration from their daily use. Right. So and people people need to need to understand that we don't want to be in the news any more than you want to be in the news. Right. 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 I mean, we, we, we want you to have a great experience with our products, just like you want to have a great experience with our products. And, and if you get breached, it's not just your name that gets, you know, kind of kind of out there publicized. It's our name as well. Right. We wrote the OS. We're the guys that that, you know, ha that created the software that got exploited. So we don't, we don't want that any more than you want that. No, absolutely not. And uh, I had a customer ask me recently, why should we look to you for security expertise? Why not look to one of the security boutique firms? And my answer is very simple. We're the factory team. In fact, you can look at this as sort of the split between mechanics and the dealership. If you get your car repaired by a mechanic, they're somewhat agnostic. Their goal is to repair cars. So their focus is on ensuring that you come back and you have your car repaired there. The dealership has a different incentive. The reason that they have a service center is because they want you to buy another one of their cars. They don't want you to buy another car from a different competitor later. They want you to continue buying from them. So the incentive is, is extremely different. That's our incentive. We're the factory team. We're the dealership. We want you to continue buying Microsoft software as opposed to going to another operating system. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned you mentioned using the same local admin password across multiple boxes. I think I think one of the things that we're battling here is just kind of human nature, right? It's yeah. it's very easy for somebody to do that because then they don't have to remember what the password for this box was, what the password for that box was. But there there there's a you know something that that you're probably not thinking about when you do that and that is the fact that you know how many boxes get exploited because you use the same password over and over again. Yeah. Having a common administrator password creates the links between the nodes in the graph that I displayed before. And right. what we're trying to do, it, it's sort of a, a form of the Lockheed Martin kill chain. We're trying to sever the kill chain at multiple points. If you think back to the slide where I had the multiple workstations, there are numerous ways that we can 
sever communications between them. We can have randomized local administrator passwords. We could have separate service accounts for all of the services running on those systems. We can put firewall rules in place that prevent them. So we can make the system more and more secure by taking these very specific actions. But ultimately, the thing that's going to have the greatest overall value, the greatest overall impact, is ensuring that the privileged credentials are never exposed to an attacker, that the, the attacker never gets the chance to see those privileged credentials. Never can see them, let alone steal them. And that's right. what this PAW guidance is all about. It's, it's actually it's a subcategory of the securing privileged access piece uh, up on TechNet. It's, the URL is on screen, uh, aka.ms slash cyberpaw. There is also aka.ms slash privsec, P-R-I-V-S-E-C, and that takes it to the parent page that's on screen. If you look at the navigation pane in the screenshot, you can see security, securing privileged access. PrivSec is the securing privileged access. Right now, we only have two subcategories, privileged access workstations and the securing privileged access reference material. But in the future, we're going to put more on, uh, online. We're going to make more of, of our security content freely available, again, because we're trying to get our customers secure, help them get secure and stay secure. Because we're the factory team. Because we're the factory team. We want you to buy more Microsoft software, <laughs> basically. Now, the privileged access workstations, the, the central tenets for the pause, number one, we want to make sure that they're built securely, that these systems are basically hardened against attack from the very, very beginning. We use the clean source principle so that we want to make sure that you're using known good hardware bought directly from a trusted manufacturer with good control of their supply chain. We want to make sure that you're using a clean image so we, we actually recommend things that people think are, are incredibly paranoid almost. We recommend that you actually download the ISO, the, uh, the DVD for Windows 10 Enterprise, for, via two separate internet connections and then compare the hashes to make sure that the two of them match so that there's no question that they weren't intercepted or uh, tampered with in any way. And then you build that at your operating system image for the PAW in a clean room separate from the internet. You do all of these different things on trusted hardware with TPM 2.0 that's capable of UEFI, ELAM, Secure Boot, all of the wonderful things that are built into the, our more recent operating systems. And we specifically want Windows 10 Enterprise because that enables Credential Guard and Device Guard upon which we build a lot of our foundational security pieces in the PAW model. And then Building on that, we also try to reduce the attack surface as much as possible, which means we have the bare minimum of applications on the system. No Internet Explorer, no browser, unless, of course, it's for cloud administration. We'll talk about that in a minute. But we lock down the browsing. We prevent the installation of additional applications using AppLocker. We ensure that the, that the workstation is not uh, configured using the same security pieces, the same, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here, uh, service accounts. It doesn't use the same service accounts as other systems do, so that the attacker wouldn't be able to parlay compromise of the, you know, the SCCM service account to attack the PAW. We make sure that there are no line of business applications. It's kind of like Joe Friday from Dragnet, just the facts, ma'am. Yeah. Try to reduce the surface as much as humanly possible. And then last but not least, access restrictions. I mentioned before that the only people that log on to PAWS are privileged admins. And, the, and those people cannot log on to other systems. You can't use your domain admin account on a regular workstation, and you can't use your regular account on a domain admin workstation, on a, on a PAW. Overall, we, we kind of characterize that last bit as make it hard to do the wrong thing, but easy to do the right thing. Yeah, and I have customers that do that pretty pretty effectively. They have user account names that have a different character in front of them if it's their admin account, and they, of course, have different passwords for their admin accounts. Mm -hmm. A lot of customers are even doing two-factor now with smart cards. So all of that stuff is great. Yeah. Two-factor is fantastic, or properly it's multi-factor, because you can actually have you can add a third or a fourth or a fifth in there as well. But one of the things about multi-factor is that if you leave the smart card in the reader, the attacker actually can access the smart card just as if it's 
a regular identity. And in fact, when you use a smart card for interactive logon, Windows is actually creating an NTLM hash in the background and storing it in LSAS just as if you typed a password. So there are plenty of customers that, that ask when we talk about pass the hash or credential theft more broadly. They ask, does multi-factor solve that problem? And unfortunately, no, it doesn't. Multi-factor is fantastic for remote access scenarios, proving it's truly you because you know not only the username, but you have the smart card associated with that username. But at the same time, it can potentially lull some customers into a false sense of security, thinking that because they have that smart card, that they're protected against all ills. And that's, that's just not the case. It's a piece of the puzzle. In fact, we, we recommend the use of smart cards in some of our other deliverables, including the uh, enhanced security admin environment. But the smart card itself is not a panacea. It's part of the solution. It's not a complete solution in and of itself. Yeah, absolutely. That was a long response to your, your off-the-cuff statement, but I have a... No, that, that's absolutely... The true. hobby horse for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I didn't realize that there was an NTLM hash that got generated because of the smart card. That's actually pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah and uh, you can act, it, it never changes. So it's the same hash forever. The way that you would change it is actually toggling the smart card required for interactive logon checkbox on the account. We call that Skrill uh, for the, from the initials, S-C-R-I-L. And if you toggle Skrill, just turn it off, turn it right back on, it doesn't impact the smart card or the smart card pin. All it does is changes the has, hash associated with that particular account. Wow, where is that stored? Is that a registry key or? Uh, the smart card required for interactive logon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I believe it's actually a value in either user account control or in DS heuristics, actually. Uh, just, be wondering, user account. just wondering, yeah. we, we just finished a series on PowerShell, and I'm just wondering if there's a way to toggle it via PowerShell. Oh, would I'm sure there of, is. I, would I don't know what it neat, is. Right? would be kind of neat for uh, uh, a customer to maybe push out a login script that toggles it every time mm -hmm. somebody logs in. Actually, what we're seeing is that organizations are doing that on a regular basis, that they have a script that toggles it for all of their smart card enabled users, and it happens at like 3 o'clock in the morning. You, you don't want to toggle it when the person is actually logging in or is online, because then it invalidates the existing hash, and they would need to log in a second time to, gen to get the new one. So it's, it would be a user disruption. But you can, you can manage it after the fact. <clears throat> yeah. Excuse me. Cool deal. Yeah, that's cool. So... There are two primary uh, deployment models for PAWS. The preferred model, by far the preferred model, is to have separate systems. You have a physical workstation, you have a physical PAW. And the reason for this is it sends a really strong signal. I'm doing admin work. Oh, I need to use the right-hand system. I'm doing regular work. Oh, I use the left-hand system. I actually know one customer that went as far as is literally painting the the hand rests on the keyboard for the PAW, bright red, just to make it a really clear visual signal that this is the one you use your red account on. And I thought that was a fantastic, uh, fantastic thing. Again, sends a really, really strong signal. Yeah. But it's act that's additional hardware. And sometimes people just, for some strange reason, don't want to carry an extra 10 pounds with them everywhere they go. So it is possible to use a physical PAW, and then connect to a virtual daily use system. And there are two traditional mechanisms for doing that. <clears throat> the first is a local hypervisor. So whether you're running Windows 10 and Hyper-V, uh, as we strongly recommend for a PAW, or you're running VMware, a local daily use system running within the confines of the PAW itself. Or you can connect to a virtual desktop instance running off of a virtualization farm in your place of business so that instead of running a, a local hypervisor, you would run off of a server-based hypervisor. Now, this is a val absolutely valid option, and I know customers that have been experimenting with this and going with this over the last couple of years. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's slightly less secure than the separate hardware model. Unfortunately, there are sandbox escapes, there are escalations of privilege that allow somebody to go from a virtual machine, a guest, to the host itself and access content and memory on the host. Uh, they're few and far between and most of them, all of the ones that I know of for Hyper-V have been patched or there are patches available for them. But it's, it, is, it does introduce that risk where that risk does not exist if it's separate physical hardware. 
So we recommend, strongly recommend that customers that do choose to use a privileged access workstation, that they use separate hardware. Now, one question that we get a lot is, can I bring this home? What, 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 what if I need to do administration at 2 o'clock in the morning? Are you saying I have to drive into the office to get to my workstation? No, no. These workstations can be laptops. That's, in fact, why Mark and I chose to use the, the icons of the laptops themselves. You can use a laptop at home on your network. Your son's downstairs playing Xbox Live. Your daughter's on Facebook. Your wife is watching Netflix. And you're on your workstation using the, uh, on the same network, using the same network resources. All of the traffic is essentially bouncing off because the only systems that your workstation can connect to are your IPsec endpoints for your VPN and then all of the internal resources to which you should have access. And again, we create rules as part of PAW, create rules allowing the, the workstation to talk to these resources but not these other resources. The daily use system has unfettered access to the, the content, but the PAW has limited access only to the things that it actually needs to administer. Awesome. That's cool stuff. Now, one thing that I have to highlight, and I think this is the last slide, one thing I have to highlight is the order is extremely important in the virtualization. It, you cannot go from a user workstation to an admin VM. Because anything I do in the admin VM is essentially under the control of the workstation itself. Although the credentials may not be directly exposed, because you're, you're not running, uh, the, the attacker can't run code within the VM, the VM itself could be compromised by the administrator of the user workstation. For example, I can have screen scraping software that records everything that I just did in the VM. I can export the VM itself, I can export the VHD, to another system for offline cracking and analysis. I could have a keystroke logger running on the user workstation to record every keystroke that takes place in that admin VM. So unfortunately, going from a user workstation to an ad admin VM PAW, it has a huge risk of a privilege escalation. But if you go the other way around, if the physical device is the PAW and you access a user VM, well, the PAW never talks directly to the internet. The PAW doesn't have access, or the attacker doesn't have access to the PAW. The user VM talks to the internet, has email, has all of the risks of privilege escalation, but if the attacker compromises the user VM, there's no way to get back to the PAW. Even if he installs a keystroke logger on the user VM, it doesn't work on the PAW. It works on the virtual keyboard within the VM. So it's a bit of a change from the model that people are very, very used to. We've trained people over years and years that you log into a workstation with a low trust account and you use run as to elevate your privileges. Well, unfortunately, that doesn't really work anymore. Run as puts credentials and memory into LSAS for the attacker to grab. We need to train people to log into the privileged access workstation with their privileged credentials and then downgrade the connection to the user VM using their regular user credentials. Again, it's culture change. It's a bit, bit of a shock for people, but it's the most secure way of doing administration. Yeah, that was cool. So, John, man, thanks for coming on and doing this with us. You're very welcome. Glad to get the word out about PAW. Uh, one thing I want to say is we didn't, as part of this, go through the actual instructions, go through the details, but you'll find that the article for which I showed the link, again, it's aka.ms slash cyberpaw, the instructions are pretty detailed. Do this, do this, do this. Go into the registry, configure this. Go into GPO and configure this. Uh, all of that information is there. If you have any issues actually following the steps in the guidance, feel free to contact us. It's cyberdocfeedback at microsoft.com. And just let us know what, where, where our instructions failed you, and we'll uh, help you out and make sure that we get it right for, the, for everybody else that uses the same instructions. Yeah, well, you guys heard it. I mean, that's an awesome offer. And, and uh, again, thanks for being on the show. This was a really interesting topic. You're very welcome, Lex. Glad to be here, and thanks for having me. Okay, guys, I guess that's it. That's your Taste of Premiere.